from Hardwick's Miscellany of Deep Void Flora and Fauna, Chapter 12. The Cilephopoda Aetherius Gius, or Sky Squid, as it is commonly known, is one of the most formidable and mysterious creatures of the Deep Void. It is a massive invertebrate, measuring up to 120 feet in length, with a bulbous head, two large, glowing eyes, and eight long tentacles. The sky squid is capable of producing a powerful jet of gas from its siphon, propelling it through the depths of the Void Sea at tremendous speeds. It can also change its colour and texture to blend in with surroundings, making it a master of camouflage. The sky squid is normally a deep-dwelling creature, preferring the murky, toxic depths of the Void Sea, where it is speculated that it feeds upon void spiders, geloids, and other indigenous creatures. However, it occasionally rises to the surface, especially during the mating season, or when disturbed by natural phenomena, such as energy storms. When it does so, it poses a grave threat to any skyships that cross its path. The sky squid is known to attack skyships with its powerful tentacles, either dragging them down into the depths, or crushing them and tearing them apart. It can also use its ink sac to release a cloud of dark fluid that obscures the vision of the skyship's crew and interferes with their navigational instruments. The sky squid has been the subject of many legends and tales among skyfarers, many of whom regard the creature with a mixture of awe and fear. Some claim that the sky squid is the guardian of the Void Sea, protecting it from intruders and invaders. Others believe that the sky squid is a malevolent beast that delights in destroying sky ships and devouring their crews, while still others speculate that the sky squid is an intelligent being that communicates with other members of its species through complex patterns of colour and sound. Whatever the truth may be, the sky squid remains one of the most elusive and fascinating creatures of the deep void. It is a rare sight indeed to behold one of these majestic and deadly animals in their natural habitat. Only the most daring and adventurous naturalists have attempted to study them up close, risking their lives for a glimpse of their secrets. Hello and welcome to The Lone Adventurer, an actual play solo RPG podcast with me, Carl White. I will be your narrator, your games master and your guide as we follow our heroes on their journey into the unknown. For this game, I will be using the Iron Sworn Starforged rule set, as well as a variety of other systems, tools and tables as they take my fancy. A word of warning. The following scenes may contain mature themes and disturbing imagery. Listener discretion is advised. The adventure continues. Last time on The Lone Adventurer, our heroes discovered that they had strayed some distance from their intended course. In order to get them back on track, Mina risked skirting the flux, an area of the Void Sea where reality itself became fluid and unpredictable. Resting overnight in the relative protection of a floating mass of bones, they spotted evidence of magical activity from deep within the boneyard, and when morning came, they investigated. What they found filled them with both wonder and terror, an active doomspire. And as if that wasn't enough, all that magical disturbance seemed to have stirred up something from the depths. The Dead Reckoning and her crew came under attack from not one, but three Sky Squid. For a moment, it looked as though they might get away, but that hope was snatched away as the ship was caught in a squid's deadly embrace. Now the crew are trapped, and moments away from certain destruction. Mina knows with a cold certainty that their vessel is seconds away from being crushed to kindling. She's never been one to pray to the Seven. To her distinctly rational way of thinking, 
there is little chance that the random wishes of any given individual are likely to make much impact on the consciousness of a 900 foot tall metal colossus untold thousands of miles away. But she prays now, and fervently, as she diverts power from all systems and cranks up the shield dial to maximum. The ship's lights flicker and dim, the steady hum of the ship Arcanian Drive dropping in pitch and then cutting out altogether. In the sudden quiet that follows, the creaks and groans of the ship's hull as the pressure mounts are all the more alarming. Mina, Cadmus calls down to her, alarm evident in his voice. What's happening? Mina clenches her fists, eyes on the steadily rising gauge, waiting, waiting. Hold on! And pray this works, she yells, judging it to be mere instants before the ship's wooden beams and support struts give way. She flips back several heavy switches above her head and then pulls hard on a lever. The ship's shields flare into life, a flickering emerald glow bathing the interior of the ship. And But this time, although the ship's shields manifest close to the ship's hull as they did before, they then suddenly expand out to a distance of perhaps 15 feet surrounding the dead reckoning like a bubble, breaking the shocked squid's grasp on the vessel and creating the briefest window of opportunity. Mina slams the drive back into life, the little ship bursting free of the creature's flailing tentacles and accelerating with nose pointed straight up along the side of the doomspire. You did it! We're free! Cadmus calls back, but his elation is short-lived. No, no, the others have caught up! They're closing, Mina! They're almost upon us! That's what I'm counting on, Mina growls, bringing the ship out and under one of the massive vents, then looping it straight towards the Doomspire's exposed interior. Cadmus's voice rises in terror. Mina, what are you doing? We're heading straight into the Doomspire! The vast technomantic engine's interior is crafted of black iron, like the exterior, but this close-up, lit by the repeated bright flashes of arcing purple and blue light that dance across every surface, it is more like a strobe-lit vision of hell. Some dimly detached part of Mina's mind is speculating that these repeated bursts of magical energy must be the result of the Doomspire's complex venting processes, a byproduct, perhaps, of fusing magic and technology on such an incredible scale. If this is the amount of power that is generated simply as a byproduct of the core functioning of the system, imagine how much energy could be generated under full load. What is this thing capable of? Thankfully, a more present, immediate part of her is fully focused on the task at hand. Banking hard to the left, she takes the ship under a huge arc of energy, the ship's shields sparking wildly where they come into close proximity. She banks back the other way, narrowly avoiding getting blasted in two as another eruption of raw power bursts from the vent walls. One of the pursuing squid is not so lucky an arcanic discharge catches it square on. At one moment it is there, the next it has exploded into a shower of liquefied flesh and chitin. The remaining two squid fall back, hesitant, then turn and flee the devastating power of the Doomspire. I think we're past the worst of it, Mina calls up, flicking on the ship's lights. I'm taking us further in. She takes the ship into a slow dive, the tiny vessel utterly dwarfed by the unimaginably vast ducts and bizarre alien machinery that surrounds them as they drop silently into darkness. So Nina's not dead yet, though it remains to be seen whether that latest gambit has brought on a fatal myocardial infarction in Cadmus. Before we get into the mechanics that lie behind this mysterious new environment our heroes find themselves in, let's step through how the remainder of that chase scene played out. We started with the crew of the Dead Reckoning in a bad spot. Now, I touched on this concept last time, but to recap, in a fight, your position is defined as one of two states. When you're in control, you make proactive moves to gain advantage and inflict forceful damage or destruction. When you are in a bad spot, you must make reactive moves to get into position to overcome hazards and thwart attacks. Now, this deceptively simple concept lies at the heart of what makes conflict in Starforged so narratively tense and exciting and so satisfying to play. 
it perfectly replicates that cinematic ebb and flow of high-velocity action scenes, and allows genuinely unpredictable, exciting action to emerge from just a few simple dice rolls. Each to their own, but to my mind, this system is far more elegant and far more rewarding than the more traditional RPG systems like D&D. So, with the ship about to be crushed, it was time to make the React Under Fire move. Now, this one says, when you are in a bad spot and take action in a fight to avoid danger or overcome an obstacle, envisage your approach and roll. If you are changing the plan, finding a way out, or cleverly bypassing an obstacle, roll plus wits. Bear in mind that I had a choice here when envisaging my escape from this challenge. Using wits was not my only option. Many moves, like this one, give you a choice of approaches. If I'd been in pursuit, fleeing, dodging, getting back into position, or taking cover, I'd have rolled plus edge. If I'd been remaining stalwart against fear or temptation, well, that would have been a roll plus heart. And if I'd been blocking or diverting with force or taking a hit, I'd have rolled plus iron. And finally, if I'd been moving into hiding or creating a distraction, that would have been a roll plus shadow. Anyway, I went with the cunning plan option, and I got a weak hit. On a weak hit, you avoid the worst of the danger, or overcome the obstacle, but not without cost. Make a suffer move, minus one. You stay in a bad spot. In this case, the hull was under pressure, and all three squid were closing in. The obvious suffer move here was withstand damage, representing the potential structural damage to the ship. But that, again, was by no means my only choice. I could instead have gone with endure stress, representing the mental strain of this situation on Mina. I could have picked lose momentum, as their escape was thwarted. I could have chosen companion takes a hit, if it turned out perhaps that Cadmus had failed to strap in, or even endure harm if Mina was not following her own advice on that front. There are always an interesting range of choices. Anyway, I went with the more vanilla withstand damage, and that states, when your vehicle faces a damaging situation or environment, suffer minus one integrity for minor damage, minus two for serious damage, or minus three for major damage. If your integrity is zero, you lose momentum, equal to any remaining damage. Then, if your integrity is zero, or you choose to resist the damage, roll plus integrity. So, I rolled plus integrity and got a strong hit, and chose as a result to have my shields repel the damage, and because of my reinforced hull asset, I also gained plus one momentum, which took me back up to ten. However, I was still in a bad spot and so I decided to make a high-risk move to try and get myself out of it. The Clash move says, When you are in a bad spot and fight back against a foe at close quarters, roll plus iron. Now, as I say, this is a risk. Plus iron is not one of my best stats, and the penalties for failing to get a good result on this move are quite draconian. But luckily for me, I got a strong hit. On a strong hit, mark progress twice, you overwhelm your foe, and you are in control. So I was doing pretty well. I was back in control, and up to seven on my progress track. I decided at this point to push my luck one last time, and make a gain ground roll. When you are in control and take action in a fight to reinforce your position or move towards an objective, envisage your approach and roll. If you are in pursuit, Fleeing or manoeuvring, roll plus edge. And once again, I got a hit and was able to mark progress. Now I was ready to take decisive action. The take decisive action move is the culmination of a combat, a sort of special move that utilises the progress track that you've been building instead of the normal action dice. This move says... When you seize an objective in a fight, envisage how you take decisive action... Then, roll the challenge dice and compare it to your progress. If you are in control, check the result as normal. If you are in a bad spot, count a strong hit without a match as a weak hit, and a weak hit as a miss. I rolled, and once again got another strong hit. Against deadly odds, 
and thanks to some astonishingly lucky dice rolling, I prevailed. My foes were either dead or fled, and I'd achieved the objective I'd set out to overcome. I'd escaped the Sky Squid. Now I found myself on the cusp of a new challenge. Let's see what the interior of the Doomspire has in store for us. Cadmus clambers down from the gunner's port on shaking legs as the ship glides into a gentle landing. Thrice blessed Ankara preserve us, he splutters as he enters the cockpit and collapses onto the bench seating, his face ashen. Each time I think you can't terrify me any further, you discover new ways to prove me wrong. Barbican, implacable, stomps in behind him and stands waiting for instruction. Now that the adrenaline is starting to wear off, Mina is looking pretty shaken herself. Believe me, it's not by choice, Cadmus. I can only assume those squid were attracted by the tower's arcanic releases, or perhaps by the ozone that arcanicity generates as a byproduct. She takes a deep, shaky breath. But on the plus side, that pursuit has helped make our decision for us. We're here now inside an actual doomspire, which is something I'd never dreamed I'd hear myself saying. Let's take a moment to recover and to prepare, and then... Cadmus groans. You can't seriously mean to venture out of the relative safety of our ship and attempt, on foot, an exploration of an impossibly vast, impossibly ancient, impossibly deadly machine that we understand next to nothing about... Mina grins back at him, and Cadmus turns on his heel, throwing despairing hands in the air. What am I saying? Of course you can. Perhaps an hour later, the intrepid crew emerge from the ship, clad in depth suits and breathing apparatus, shoulder-mounted arcanic torches piercing the darkness. Mina has done her best to prepare a set of technomantic devices for this mission, but the limited time available, not to mention the not inconsiderable stresses of the preceding encounter, have left her jittery and struggling to focus. She's not at her best, though she does her best not to let it show. Very well, Cadmus, Barbican. The ship can descend no further, so we're on foot from here on in. We don't know what awaits us, but whatever we may encounter in here, just remember this. We are investigating a place that has probably remained undisturbed for thousands of years. Something has brought this doomspire back to life, and we need to find out what, and more importantly, why. And, if possible, we need to figure out whether we can turn this situation to our advantage, or whether this represents a threat. We go in quiet and careful, but if we run into trouble, don't hold back. She pats the large handgun holstered at her hip. Understand? Okay, let's move out. As the team step out of the dead reckoning and into the doomspire, Mina feels a new surge of adrenaline. She feels the thrum of power underfoot and takes in the monstrous scale of the tower's interior. This place makes the underpipes seem like mere plumbing. It seems at once almost sacral, and yet subtly horrifying. And though she does her best to keep her thoughts free of fruitless speculation, she can't help but wonder, what was this place once used for? Who built it? And why? What secrets does the tower hold, and what dangers does it hide? This way, Mina says, her voice seeming a very small thing in this cavernous, ancient place. The crew descend through passageways and structures that seem almost incomprehensible, seemingly built with little consideration of the human form. Whatever creatures built this strange place, it seems they had little in common with the investigators that now explore it. Steps are irregular or non-existent. Passages grow narrow or incredibly wide or simply stop altogether with little rhyme or reason. The architecture is endly unusual and disconcerting place is of a scale and a structure that seems utterly inhuman. The further they descend, the hotter and more murky the air becomes. Their torches penetrate less and less distance into the gloom, visibility dropping as their beams are increasingly diffused by airborne particulate matter. Worse still, both Mina and Cadmus find themselves growing uncomfortably hot. 
sweating profusely within the claustrophobic confines of their depth suits. It all contributes to a growing sense of tension and paranoia. Cadmus opens a leather cuff on his protective suit to reveal a small set of dials. The air has grown increasingly toxic the further we've descended, he informs Mina. It doesn't appear to be caustic yet, but I suppose it can only be a matter of time. The good thing we have the suits, then. Wait, what's that? Mina goes rigid with shock, gripping Cadmus's arm. Look! Ahead of them, emerging from the mist as they approach, are a series of tall objects, containers of some sort. The cause of Mina's alarm becomes more apparent as they draw closer. The door to each container has been forced open, their strange contents rifled through and scattered. Mina points a shaking finger at an object amid the debris that seems incongruously mundane in this bizarre place. Cadmus, that's a crowbar. The implications spread out ahead of her, fracture lines forming in what she had supposed to be reality. We are not the first explorers to come here. With the Sky Squid progress track completed, I did a little housekeeping. Mina has a couple of activities in flight at the moment, each represented by a 10 box progress track. She has the Journey to Conflict track as a result of her undertaken expedition move, taken back in Chapter 1. So far, that has two boxes filled, with additional boxes getting filled as a mechanical result of getting hits on subsequent expedition moves. That won't progress any further until I make another undertaken expedition move in relation to the journey. But she also has a vow track in play, Disrupt the Armada at Conflict. Now that's an extreme vow, one that advances quite slowly and in a different way from the expedition track. For quests set up by the Swear and Iron Vow move, the advancement mechanic is the Reach a Milestone move. And that move says, when you make headway on your quest by doing one of the following, overcoming a critical obstacle, gaining a meaningful insight, completing a perilous expedition, acquiring a crucial item or resource, earning vital support, defeating a notable foe, you may mark progress per the rank of the vow. I think the discovery of this activated Doomspire and the subsequent entry into it qualifies as a milestone, and so I've marked two ticks, or half of one of those ten boxes, in accordance with the progression rate for extreme tracks. Next, I made some preparations for the exploration to come. I used Mina's Technomancy asset to create the ability for her to cast spells, taking a small hit to her spirit as a result of making a weak hit. Next, I made the Secure an Advantage move, represented in the fiction by suiting up, gathering tools and planning what to do next, and a strong hit here gave me plus one on my next roll, Undertake an Expedition. Now, I could have treated this exploration as either a single or a series of explorer waypoint moves, but I wanted to zoom in a bit more, to spotlight this location in a bit more depth. And so I chose to set up a new expedition, nested within the broader Journey to Conflict expedition, by making a new Undertaken Expedition move. I made this move, adding the plus one from my Secure and Advantage, and another plus one from my Infiltrator asset. That says, when you make a move to break into a secure site, infiltrate a protected area, or hack or manipulate a secure system, add plus one, and take plus one momentum on a hit. On a strong hit with a match, access is easier than expected, take plus one momentum. I decided the team were going in carefully and quietly, and so I rolled plus shadow and managed a weak hit. My expedition to uncover the mystery of the Doomspire was off to a good start. I had one box complete. However, this success came at a cost. I decided that I was going to face peril at a waypoint and turn to the Vault Oracle to help me envisage what I'd found. In Starforged, the default setting assumes that ancient beings built vast and mysterious vaults of great power throughout the galaxy. Exploring Precursor Vaults is something that only the insane, the suicidal, or the solo player character would ever really consider. 
And so, the game comes with a series of oracles that help you determine the construction, the appearance, the purpose, features, perils, and opportunities that lie within these vaults. Now, I already knew a fair bit about my vault, its shape, what it was constructed of, and so on, and so I skipped straight to the Interior First Look oracle, the Interior Feature oracle, and, because of the consequence of that weak hit, the Interior Peril oracle. And here is what I rolled. First look. Excessive heat. Signs of invasive life forms. Feature. Looted or empty containers. Peril. Toxic atmosphere. Rivals seek what lay within. In addition to using the default vault oracles, I'm also using this opportunity to set up something called an oracle array. This optional rule allows me to group together a number of different oracles. In this case, a number of different vault oracles combined with oracles from the most appropriate of the supplied location themes. In this case, mechanical. Doing this narrows the focus down from the broad range of topics my perchance oracle might throw up, although there is still a small chance with the array that my perchance oracle might be referenced. But what the array does do is increase the depth richness and unpredictability of responses to my oracle questions whilst keeping those responses tightly on message and directly relevant to the location that we're exploring. In fact, I've set up two Doomspire oracle arrays, one for exploration questions and another for trouble questions. I've included full details of those in the show notes if you're interested to see how they've been built. No doubt we'll find out what those oracles have in store for us next time. You have been listening to The Lone Adventurer, a solo RPG podcast played, written, and performed by me, Carl White. If you've enjoyed this episode, please consider telling your friends about it or leaving a five-star review wherever you get your podcasts. It really is a huge help. You can find me on Twitter at TheLoneADV. You can email me at TheLoneADV at gmail.com or follow my blog at carlillustration.wordpress.com You can find show notes for this episode and all the others at theloneadventurer.podbeam.com where I include any links mentioned in the episode as well as mechanics information. I also include a link to a full episode transcript. The story will continue in the next episode of The Lone Adventurer. Thank you for listening. Volt enters the office with his usual swagger, tossing his hat onto the hat stand with a practised flick of his wrist. He grins over at the secretary, Digby, who, as usual, is busily hammering away at his Klinkman and Schmidt keywriter. The portly little man glances up and, seeing Volt, does his best to suppress the smile that spreads regardless across his thin lips. A flush spreads across his cheeks, his eyes sparkle. Is the old man in his office, Digby? Volt asks casually, leaning against the desk. He is, but he's not in a good mood, Digby warns him, the secretary's voice lowering conspiratorially. He's been on the speaking phone with the First Minister all morning. Something about a rogue agent. Volt raises a perfectly trimmed eyebrow. A rogue agent? Any idea who? Digby shakes his head. I don't know, Rex. He didn't tell me, but I did hear him mention how dangerous the whole situation was, along with a code name, Scorpion. Scorpion? The name means nothing to Volt. He straightens and adjusts his collar in the mirror. Well, I suppose I'd better go and see what he wants. He moves towards the door to W's office, but Digby stops him with an urgent hand upon his arm. Rex, Digby says, his eyes plaintive. Do be careful, won't you? Volt looks back at him and smiles faintly. He leans in and whispers in the smaller man's ear, Don't you worry, Digby. I always use protection. He turns from the flustered secretary, knocks and opens W's office door. 
You asked to see me, W. Alexis Montessario, whisperer of the House of Whispers, looks up from the papers and maps that cover his desk. He does not look happy. Now, Volt, there you are, he says curtly. Close the door and take a seat, would you? Volt does as he's bid and waits for the whisperer to continue. I have a new assignment for you, Volt, W says. A very important one, a very sensitive one. I'm listening. Volt's voice and demeanour are cool, implacable even. But inside, he feels the thrill that so often accompanies the promise of danger. W picks up a manila folder and opens it. He slides a luminograph across the desk, a sepia head and shoulders portrait. Volt stares at it for several seconds before slowly raising cold grey eyes to meet the whisperers. They betray nothing. He knows the woman in the luminograph, of course, and knows her all too well. It is a woman he once loved. That, says W, stabbing a long index finger down at the luminograph, is codename Scorpion. I believe you two were acquainted. A reliable, yet somewhat pedestrian agent, or so I'd always thought. But she's turned traitor, Vault, betraying the House of Whispers and our allies, selling our secrets, killing our operatives. She has become a serious threat to House Montessario security, possibly even an existential threat. Vault feels a more personal pang of betrayal and resentment. He had trusted her. He had risked his life for her. And in return, the bitch had stabbed him in the back. What do you want me to do, sir? He asks, his voice flat. W looks at his most lethal agent with a hard expression. Your mission is to find my sister and to bring her in, Volt. Alive if possible. Dead if necessary. <laughs>